my favorite move from slapstick right there, <laughs> the old being startled. If you have your Bible, please find the book 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This morning we're going to be in verses 9 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. When you find that, if you would not mind standing with me, Sarah, go ahead, Sarah, and stand. You can stand now. It would be perfectly okay. She wasn't paying attention. I had to say it until she was paying attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, and it reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, and ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, we just pray for your blessing upon this service and the remainder of this service where we commit ourselves to studying your word. And I just pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will open our hearts and also deliver this message straight to our lives, right where it counts, Lord. Hit us right where it counts so that we can live our lives to honor you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There is something that is unsettling concerning the nature of what is being presented today as Christianity or what some people may define as exercising faith in Jesus Christ. And I suppose that this phenomena has always been present within the church, but I do not remember it being so prevalent as it is today. And the phenomena to which I am referring is, this, listen, is this. It is the failure in professed Christians to actually live the Christian life. Amen. Recently, I've been very, become very <coughs> fond of asking people who claim that they know Jesus, who claim that they've had a life-changing encounter with the Messiah. I've, been fond of, I've become very fond of asking these people, if you have had a life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus, how come your life has not changed? And that's absolutely what the heart of this uh, message is. That's what I would like to address this morning. That's, this is what lies behind the message for today. Are you a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus? Do you sincerely desire for him to radically and forever change your life? Or are you just window shopping Christianity? Mm -hmm. Last week, last week we learned from scripture, the only way that we're going to see Jesus is to be honest. The only way any person comes to Jesus is to be honest. Honest with ourselves, honest with God, because listen, God is true. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And he only deals with people on the basis of truth. Amen. So if you lie to God, listen, if you're fond of playing games when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're fond of playing religious games with God, the only person that's full in this whole endeavor is you. God deals only in truth, folks. Amen. You know what you call someone who's self-deceived? A person who believes their own nonsense? Even when they know it's nonsense, you know what you call a person that does this? You call them a fool. Only a fool believes their own nonsense. Only a fool believes their own lies. And, and we're living in an age of great deception. We are living in an age of great deception. The Bible told us that at the time, uh, at the close of the age, it will be a time of great deception. And the devil is the master of lies. And he's got a lot of disciples, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And, and deception from the world, well, that's to be expected. But when it comes to being honest, and, and I know this morning, I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers. When it comes to being honest, I actually expect lost people to be dishonest. I do. Whenever I tell them about Jesus, when I ask them about their uh, relationship with the Lord, I expect lost people to be dishonest. I expect them to perpetrate lies. I expect them to play the fool. Amen. 
But what gives me problems is people who lie, people who are self-deceived concerning Christ Jesus, who are carried away by their own imagination and have firmly convinced themselves that they are in fact Christians when they're not. And let me put this another way. What bothers me is people who claim that Jesus has changed their life and yet their lives uh, reflect nothing of change. Nothing whatsoever. They don't reflect Christ in anything that they do. That's what's bothering me. That's what's been plaguing me this entire week. Their lives haven't changed, not even in the slightest. My dad would say to some people, listen, if your religion hadn't changed your life, maybe you ought to change your religion. So go ahead and tell me all, all about how Jesus has really made a difference in your life with that cigarette hanging out your mouth and that beer in your hand. Go ahead. I want to hear it. Tell me all about how Jesus has transformed you into a new creation, that you are now delivered and free from sin, that you are in fact living for Jesus Christ, but you just can't make it to church two Sundays in a row. And what I hope to accomplish this morning here is to challenge everyone this morning with this question. I want to know, why did you come to the Lord Jesus? Why did you put your faith in the Lord Jesus? Are you honestly looking for real hope and real change in your life? What is the purpose behind everything that we do here in this church and in this community if it's not to affect change? Change from sinfulness and worldliness, change to godliness. To see Christ reflected in everything. Amen. And so the question that I want to place before you this morning is, why did you personally come to Jesus Christ and put your faith in Him? What did you expect would happen when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Listen, if, if, if you didn't come to Jesus to have your life fundamentally fundamentally, radically, and forever change, if you've not come to Jesus for this reason, if, you're not, if you don't belong to this church uh, for this reason that Jesus has changed your life, if you're here for some other reason, other than that you've had your life transformed by Christ, other than that you are a new creation in Christ, other than that you are dedicating your whole life to service to Christ and to your fellow brethren in Christ, you fail to understand salvation in Jesus Christ. You fail to understand what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not some social organization. We're not a social club. Listen, Christianity is about being fundamentally forever transformed by Christ Jesus. What is happening here is more than some social club. This isn't a charitable organization. This isn't a place where we gather together so we can feel good about ourselves. We're not here trying to work our way to heaven. This is the church of the living God. Amen. This is the body of Christ made up of living stones. The very temple of God that is made up of transformed people. Uh, the very temple of God made up of all new creations in Christ Jesus and so the only reason to call on the name of the Lord uh, is because of the genuine, honest, and true heartfelt desire to be saved and to be changed Amen. forever Amen. by the Lord. Amen. And, and really, it's a lot of these uh, younger folks, young Christians today, they have me perplexed. <laughs> and I know of several of them, some of them in my own family. Uh, they claim that they've had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, and, and yet their lives don't reflect any change whatsoever, no godliness whatsoever. And, and, and of course, how many of your social media have Facebook? I see their posts on, uh, on Facebook all the time because we're friends on Facebook. And this is family members and young people who claim to be Christians. And they'll post up pictures of a night of drinking and boozing and partying with the girls or hanging out with the guys. And they'll just put all that debauchery of the world right there up in public view in glorious living color for everyone to see. There's a picture of them laid out on the floor, drunk, been out reveling and, and sitting all night long. And then the very next post, I know that God loves me and that he's got an amazing plan for my life. Really? Is that it? To be drunk, to be laid out on the floor?
And isn't it amazing that when these young people go to church, they always go to these franchise operations. You know, cookie cutter churches. Tell them what they want to hear. How is it that there are people who think that being saved has nothing to do with being sanctified or even living sanctified lives? How did we get to this point? The church in the United States of America today is so lay out of sin, I expect the Lord to take us back any minute. That's how ridiculously bad we've become. With that in mind, look again at what Paul writes in our text. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen carefully, underscore this in your Bible, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. In case you missed it, were, it's a be verb, as in am, is, are, will, were. And, and this word were is a be verb that denotes what? Past tense. Past tense. I'm reasonably certain of this, having spent a lot of time and money going to school to learn this very thing. I didn't learn this in English class, by the way. I learned it in Greek class because I had to learn English to learn Greek. If you ever went to the seminary, you'll know what I'm talking about. Were is a be verb that denotes past tense, clearly signifying in Christ what we once were, we are not now. That sinner that we used to be, he died with Christ on the cross. She died with Christ on the cross. That person we are now is the person who's raised to new life in Christ Jesus. And, and this is summed up in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. <laughs> The Apostle Paul is clearly defining this truth for all believers. Listen, folks, this is the word of God in Christ. Christians are no longer of the same nature that they once were. We're totally new people. Amen. If you're in Christ, you're different. If you've honestly come to Christ, you will be different because you're a new person. And what I'm telling you this morning is, I don't care how vehemently you claim to know Christ, if you can go out, out of the doors of this church and go out there and live in sin and live for the devil without once ever knowing the conviction of the Holy Spirit for that sin, you are not a Christian. You don't know Christ. You know what you are? You're a slave to sin out there giving true Christians a bad name and giving the church a bad reputation. Cut it out. Stop it. If you're not going to live for Christ, don't go tell people you're a Christian. Because you're not. You're not. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 presents a clear distinction between the life we once lived before coming to know Christ Jesus and the life that we now live by faith in Christ. There is a clear distinction between the people that we once were and the people that we now are. Amen. Clearly, some people have not thought this through. Or maybe they've never read the Bible. And so they don't understand this. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. No matter how much someone wants to believe that you can be unrepentant and still be saved, that's just not biblical, folks. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, uh, you have this uh, episode where Jesus is responding to some news about Galileans that had been murdered by the Romans while they were making sacrifices. And the Lord Jesus says, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon which the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Listen. 
Here's the thing, folks. Here's when it, when it comes to repentance, when it comes to coming to Christ by faith, you can't hold on to sin with all you've got and hold on to Christ too. You can't hold on to sin and hold on to Christ at the same time. You can't be a sinner and a saint at the same time. It's never going to happen. You're either a sinner lost in your sins or a saint that's been saved by Jesus Christ and delivered from your sins. I mean, we're fond of saying this in the church. Well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Stop it. That's not the truth. We're not a bunch of saintly sinners. There's no such thing. We are new creations in Christ. We've been delivered from sin. We've been called to live sanctified lives. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I am a former sinful man who's been delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, I now am a saint. I am sanctified in Christ. You can't be a sinner and a saint at the same time. Okay. You cannot live in that dynamic. You will destroy yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some people and they call on the name of Jesus. They want to be saved for eternity. They want to know salvation for eternity, but they're not, they don't really desire to be delivered from their sin. I mean, it could happen. Some sort of heavenly insurance plan. What we call the lifeboat theory, well, I'm not really sure if it's true or not, but in case it is, then I'll pray this prayer I don't really mean, and there's my insurance policy. But what I'm telling you is that you cannot be saved for eternity until you're delivered from sin right now. That's not the way it works. An empty, heartless, dishonest recital of the sinner's prayer, it doesn't do anything but give you a false assurance of salvation. You following me? Salvation is not in the prayer, it's in the person of Jesus Christ. You're not saved until it can honestly, honestly be said of you, and such were some of you. So, so repentance, true repentance, is a necessary prerequisite to salvation. Listen, to be saved, to be saved by Jesus Christ, you have to honestly want to be saved. Get that? To be saved, you've got to honestly want to be saved. To be delivered, you've got to honestly want to be delivered. See, there's this whole component of honesty in here that really matters. Because God is truth and he only deals in truth. Amen. So to be saved, you've got to have this genuine desire to be fundamentally transformed by Christ Jesus. And we call that desire repentance. Repentance, that's a heartfelt change of mind regarding sin. Repentance is a heartfelt change of mind about the ways of the world. It's a heartfelt change of mind about the way the world is heading and a true desire to want to go in the other direction. And when you want to see real change, not just in your circumstances. How many people come to church and they come forward and they cry and crocodile tears for Jesus just because life is hard. And they think that nobody's situation can be as worse or as bad as the situation that they're enduring right now, I got news for you. Everybody has tough times. There are good times and there are tough times. And everybody goes through them. And they come and they cry, cry crocodile tears for Jesus just because they want to be delivered from some situation. And the minute that Jesus delivers them from that situation, they're gone. That is not a heartfelt and honest cry for a true change in your life. That's just wanting to be delivered from tough times. Be saved. Listen. It's not just wanting to be delivered from circumstances. But it's wanting to see a real change in who you are. It's wanting to see a real change in who you are. I remember the day that I prayed and asked the Lord to save me. I was tired of Christopher Dysinger and his nonsense. Of playing the games that the world played. So I went and I got on my face before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're real, change me. I don't want to be this man that I am anymore. A liar and a cheat and a thief and everything else that goes with it. That's what's called repentance. It's an honest plea for forgiveness. It's an honest plea to be delivered. It's an honest plea to be saved. And that alone is what leads to a life Changing encounter with the Lord. It's life changing because when you get honest with God, 
When you honestly call on the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit just comes into your life and he quickens your spirit. See, if you don't know Jesus, your spirit's dead. You just don't know that yet. But when you come to Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes in and he makes your spirit alive. And he changes who you are at your very nature. When you honestly call on the Lord Jesus, he changes you at your very nature. The love of God takes up residence in your heart. And the way that you live your life is fundamentally changed forever. Amen. He takes away that heart of stone that we have and gives us a heart of flesh. Recreates us in his own image. That's what the Lord Jesus does. He recreates us in his own image and delivers us from the power of sin in our lives. And then the Christian from then on experiences true freedom. Do you know what true freedom is? It is the freedom to choose what you're going to do. You see, before you meet Christ, you're a slave to sin. You may think that you can control that action in your life, but you're going to find yourself falling prey to temptation again and again and again. You know why? The Bible says you are a slave to sin. Oh, you think you're free, but you don't even know what you're a slave to. But when you come to Christ and the Holy Spirit changes who you are, you become a child of God and you are set free. The very definition of the word free, to be able to choose your own uh, life. How you're going to live. What you're going to do. What you're not going to do. I said, I choose not to sin anymore. Amen. That's true freedom. Amen. That's true deliverance. The Lord Jesus re recreates you in his own image and delivers you from the power of sin. Verse 11 says, and such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So... The question then becomes, why would anyone call upon the name of the Lord Jesus who did not desire to be changed? Think about that for a while. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody come forward and say, I want to profess faith in Jesus Christ if they didn't honestly want to see a change in their life? Because in Christ we're made new, transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our sins have been washed away by the blood. We've been forgiven. And that old man, that old person that we were... It's dead. That makes us dead to sin and alive to Christ. No longer under the power of sin. No longer captivated by the world. And so, you know, if we're no longer under the power of sin and no longer captivated by the world, we cert certainly shouldn't go out there and act like the world, should we? We should find ourselves what? Contrary to the world. You cannot identify with sin and with Christ at the same time. You cannot identify with sin and with Christ at the same time. And I know, I know that there are people who are going to find what I'm saying to be controversial. The Word of God is controversial to the world. Folks, just get over it. You cannot live, identify with sin and live for sin and live for Christ at the same time. Which means, now listen, there is no such thing as a homosexual Christian. Get that? Amen. Amen. No such thing as a homosexual Christian, as there is no such thing as an adulterous Christian. There's no such thing as a murderous Christian. You following me? Whatever sin we may try to attach ourselves to and then try to attach ourselves to Christ. It's never going to work. Someone says, well, I'm a homosexual and I'm a Christian. You're going to hang your head. Don't you understand the nature of sin? You cannot grab hold of your sin with everything that you've got and then grab Christ true. It's not going to work. You're going to be torn apart. We've been delivered from sin. And that's the point. Believers don't identify with our sin. We identify with Christ. That's why we call ourselves little Christ, which is what Christians mean, by the way. I know what I'm saying is bothering you. You might want to plug your ears because it's only going to get worse. <laughs> what I'm saying is we don't identify with sin. We identify with Christ. We don't fall prey to temptation and commit sin. We don't identify ourselves through sin. Nor do genuine believers make a continued practice of sin. It's not going to happen. We don't gravitate to sin. We don't revel in sin. In fact, we find ourselves contrary to the ways of the world. We find ourselves contrary to sin. 
because we identify and because we glory in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And it's this new dynamic of being in Christ. That's what Paul's describing to the Corinthians. Look what he says in verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? And, and then he says in verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And then he goes on in verses 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Yes. Amen. That's Paul describing this new dynamic that we live in Christ. This new dynamic which allows us to see the depravity of sin. Uh, that leads to a new understanding about sin. And what the Apostle Paul is hoping to accomplish is that he wants us to have this new understanding about sin. He wants us to come to an understanding of what uh, the difference between godliness and sin, that we don't behave like this anymore. That's the point. He wants you to see the difference between the way we were and the way we are now so that he can make this point. We don't live like this anymore. Now, if you're going to go out and continue to live like the world and live in sin, please don't call yourself a Christian. You're just giving us a bad reputation. You're the reason why they say there are hypocrites in the church because you're a hypocrite in the church. Oh, I'm, get, I'm sorry if it, if it seems like I'm a little frustrated, but I am. Oh, I am. I don't understand people who claim Christ to say they love Christ. Oh, Christ is my all in all. Christ is everything to me. But I'm going out with the boys this weekend. We're going to go fishing. I know I should be in church. I know I should be telling people about Jesus. I know the Lord is coming. But right now, that tailgate party is more important. Right now, going fishing is more important. Right now, having a couple beers with the boys is more important. I don't get that. I said, well, you're a preacher. You don't understand how it is to live in the world. I'm a man. And when God called me, God saved me, and God called me, he didn't change me from being a regular old human being just like everybody else, dealing with the same trials and tests and temptations. But when I grasped the hold of Christ, I knew that he was worth everything in my life, and I'm not going to let him go, and I'll let the world go to hell and hang on to Christ with all I've got. And I don't understand Christians who don't have that same attitude. Our reward is reserved for the age to come. Paul says, we don't behave like that anymore. Sin has no control over our lives. We shouldn't act like a bunch of uninformed, unrepentant sinners. And, it, and if you've got this whole idea worked out in your mind how you can do this and still be justified before God, all you're doing is fooling yourself. And then Paul says in verse 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now listen, because the Lord Jesus went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sins, all of our sins are forgiven. That's past, present, and future. Someone says, well, how can Jesus forgive the sins I haven't even committed yet? Well, how many of your sins were in the future when Jesus went to the cross? All of them. All our sins are covered by the blood. Past, present, and future. And the thing is, in Christ, there is nothing that you can do that will cause you to lose eternal salvation. Okay? But just because you can get away with something doesn't mean you ought to do it. Just because you can do something doesn't make it, make it helpful, doesn't make it good. That's what Paul is saying. Nothing is withheld from the believer. But that doesn't mean it's helpful or good. In fact, the Bible is clear in this regard. We are not to use our liberty, we're not to use our freedom in Christ as an opportunity to gratify the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion unto the flesh, but by love serve one another. And then... And Paul, in the book of Corinthians, he continues this point with an illustration. Meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. So yes, you are free. And you can eat whatever your heart desires. And he was speaking to the Judaizers, those who came in claiming that you could only eat kosher. 
And he's saying you can eat whatever your heart desires, but that doesn't mean that what you eat is good for you. It's the same with sin in the believer's life. It's the same with freedom in the believer's life. You're free to do whatever your heart desires. That doesn't mean that everything that you do is justified, is good, or right. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you ought to. Okay? And then Paul writes, Now the body is not for fornication. God did not create you with sin in mind. Just keep that in mind. God did not create our bodies to be used as instruments of sin. God created us. We live and breathe and have our being in him. And God created us. And he gave us these bodies so that we might honor him. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And that understanding ought to color our thinking in regard to everything that we do. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And if anything, verse 19 ought to impact our thinking about what we do with these bodies that God has given us. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. That body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. And so many people today, they're living their lives as if Jesus belongs to them and not the other way around. God doesn't belong to us. We belong to him. Jesus doesn't belong to us. We belong to him. People are living today like God is someday going to be held responsible to us. And again, not the other way around. And you can clearly see it when they say something stupid like, why did God let such and such happen to me? Because I'm so special, nothing bad should ever happen. Everybody deals with difficult circumstances. These same people are complaining about their difficult circumstances. Why did God let this happen to poor little me? They don't even realize that if God wasn't good, they wouldn't understand the difference between good and evil. Again. They don't think about the dynamics of their relationship uh, with Jesus Christ, whether they even have one or not. These are people, they don't know the Lord Jesus because they're too busy assuming that if God really exists, he does so for their benefit and their pleasure alone. That God exists to suit them and their own heart's little desires. Too many people are living today as if Jesus belongs to them, not knowing that we belong to him. And that don't, that don't, listen, you belong to God, and it doesn't matter whether you've made a profession of faith in Christ or not. Because someday every knee will bow because everyone belongs to God. He's the creator. We're the creation. And it's this attitude, this understanding that people believe that God belongs to us and is here for our benefit that allows them to reason away the sinfulness of their sin and to hold that their sin is not really sin and that their sin is meaningless to God. But you know why they think that their sin is meaningless to God? Because it's meaningless to them. And that ought to tell you something. Boy, if you can go out there and sin and it has no effect on your heart, your conscience, that ought to tell you something. What it comes down to is you have a world full of people out there who are gravitating to sin. They are leaping in sin. They're loving every minute. They're reveling in sin. And they're rejoicing in it. And, and they're assuming, even though... That their lives are lived in rebellion to God. They're assuming that they're okay with God. And God is okay with them. You know what we call that? Woefully deceived. Woefully deceived. And they're fools. And many Christians have integrated this same idea into their faith. And they're, uh, they're helping to foster this idea in the church. Just live like you want to live. And God's okay with everything because God, in the end, God is love and grace. And it doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. It does matter how you live your life. And there are people and they're sitting in the church and they have no real faith in Jesus Christ. But they think they're okay with God because, well, they go to church every occasionally. They're, they're a little religious. They've hung up some crosses in their house. Lives filled with sin. Never honestly repenting of sin. They got a little smattering of religion. And yet they're enamored with sin. Because they've never gotten honest with themselves. They've never gotten honest with Christ Jesus whatsoever. Amen. Amen. 
But there are also honest believers in Christ, like our brothers and sisters in that church at Corinth, and their understanding of the rebellious and evil nature of sin and the nature of the offense of sin uh, was not complete. And that's why Paul wrote the letter. What a shame this is, though, God's children dishonoring their Heavenly Father with the temple that is their body. Listen, we haven't been saved from sin to live in sin. We haven't been created to live in sin. And we're not saved to go out and sin some more. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Bible says, and such, and such were, past tense, and such were, past tense, some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 clearly displays that Christians have changed lives. And you know what that means? It means that Christians ought to live changed lives. There ought to be a marked difference between the way that Christians, true Christians live, and the way that the world lives. I'll close by asking once again. If you've had a life-changing encounter with Christ... Why hasn't your life changed? True hope, true hope, listen. And real change is found only in a genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Genuine. That means you're honest before God and he gets honest with you. And I know it sounds kind of harsh to get up here and to say, if you're not, if you're not living like a Christian, stop calling yourself a Christian. Why, I find that offensive. Why, Jesus loves me even though... It, and, and listen, what I'm telling you is if you'll come to terms with the way you're living your life, that it is not Christian. If you'll get honest with God and say, Lord, I have not been living like a Christian even though everyone thinks that I am. If you'll get honest and repent, the Holy Spirit will take up residence in your heart and you will experience that changed life you've been pretending to have. And you'll never regret it. Not one little bit. Amen. Matter of fact, you'll start marching with Jesus and you will never look back. You'll get a hold of him with everything that you've got. You will never look back. Amen. That's what I'm calling on you to do today. If you have been playing games with God, you're not playing games with God. You're just playing games with yourself. Get free. Come to Christ for real. And you'll change your life and you'll never regret it. Amen. True hope and change is only found in a genuine relationship with Jesus. And you can have it if you will get honest with God. Let's have everything done. Every I close. If you want to be honest with God this morning, listen.